join me in thanking um, Professor Kelly for this insightful um, pre recorded lecture. I now wanted to open it up to our three panelists who are here present with us. Um, if they want to have some interactions between themselves or ask questions before we open it up to the broader audience. Remember for the broader audience, feel free to um, feed questions into the chat and we'll come to those shortly. But first I open it up to Professor Bowusi, Professor Krebs, Neil Durillo. Shall we put our uh, questions in the chat? I think you can just talk openly amongst yourselves and yeah, I, I'll moderate and interject if necessary. <laughs> If I, if I may, uh, uh, first of all, of course, uh, my congratulations also to, uh, to the speakers. It was a pleasure to share with them this uh, webinar. Uh, I have to say that uh, what Job said invites me <laughs> to some extent to ask him something, because all the cases or most of the cases he evoked uh, lamenting that uh, texts are not studied and uh, that people just look at the artifacts and not at the text, uh, well, I would have something to say, because, for example, on Gerle Libela, uh, we had a dissertation uh, by a person who's also following us here, who studied the, as carefully as possible the text of Gerle Libela, and not only the, the manuscript from the British Library, but some other 30, over 30 manuscripts and printed editions. The case, the same for the case of Gebre Manfes Caduso, we, uh, Marassini used uh, also the British Library manuscript for his critical edition. And also the colophon you showed, which is astonishing because uh, if I remember well by heart, uh, Wright says, so all this colophon cannot be. Uh, this was, he thought it should be from the 15th century if I'm right. But definitely, I also think, and I also wrote in my uh, small book on the uh, Acta File, that this uh, colophon is a strong evidence. So I would say advocating that also, uh, let's say, people who are interested in material aspects uh, also look at the text. But I, I, I agree with you that this is not always the case. And this is a problem. But I, I, so I fully share with you this concern. So we cannot divide the two. So it was more uh, a remark than uh, a question, but I invite uh, Eob uh, to expand on this point if you want. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I know in terms of um, like the philology area and people working on the text have obviously looked at different um, variants and have written great work, including uh, Nafisa, which, who worked on the Gadla Lalibela. Uh, but my point was more on drawing the resources from those stories within those manuscripts um you know for for, for historians and people who want to uh work on the cultural history um i know in in, in, in the linguist area you guys leave no stone unturned <laughs> when you're looking for manuscripts but um there are great uh evidences in in those stories about ethiopia you know geography uh, language humor um, and always kind of astonishes me. But going back to that colophon, uh, it, it's really it's astonishing. Uh, it was, you know, it, it's part of the manuscript and Wright questions it. And, uh, it, you know, it was after speaking to you that I was confident to say it's original, it's part of the work, not written later on. But what I wanted to ask you was um, the name. So we have Agbazihon or Yigbazihon, this is something that kind of uh, I, I confused tell you, I, Sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but so we discussed this at long, uh, at length when uh, we had the entry for the Encyclopedia Theopica, and I advocated for the only form that we have. So we know that uh, handbooks of literature and so on have uh, Yagb uh, or, or Agba and so on. But wherever we have a manuscript form is uh, uh, without Aleph. So uh, is as it is in this manuscript. And we adopted that form, uh, respecting the evidence that we have, particularly the coeval evidence. Uh, evidence. So I think I, I agree uh, with you on this point. This is the, an etymological reconstruction, uh, which has been done by people working on King's lists. Uh, but uh, it has no base. And it's interesting because it also show a sort of uh, Amharizing form, in fact. So uh, this is uh, li this is little gaze, mm -hmm. but it is it is written 
so already the time. And uh, only a, a, a minor point concerning uh, what you raise, this is in fact a direction towards annotating text. And again, you need uh, a lot of cooperative efforts if we want to draw historical information from this text. We need a lot of authority files, place names, uh, uh, people's names, and so on, uh, and so on. In the project, uh, which uh, limited as it is that we have tried to set up in Hamburg, uh, by the way, from uh, the Union de Academie and not from the FG, Aaron, as you say, but, you know, <laughs> sponsors are very jealous about what they are funding or not. I, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, they really, uh, so this, is, this would be the idea. So to collect and interconnect all available uh, data so that it's possible to have a text uh, in one manuscript to look at the uh, image and then to look at the text and, and then to look at the variants to know exactly which are the other manuscripts and so on. But this is something uh, which uh, is not a work for one scholar alone, of course. And so uh, we must work cooperatively. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, we have questions are rolling in, so I wonder if we should uh, ask some of these. I'll start with one um, directed from Christine Schaka to um, Professor Krebs, and it says, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Um, if I understood you correctly, one of the Ethiopian envoys requested goldsmiths and craftsmen's guild and gold leaf application. Um, given the lack of gold leaf use in Ethiopian icons and illuminated manuscripts from that period, could you please comment on this? <laughs> Um, thank you very much for that question. Um, so this is an interesting thing that sort of comes up time and time again in Ethiopian um, 15th century texts or texts relating to the 15th century. For example, we have an Ethiopian miracle of Mary um, that explicitly says that an illuminator working for Atzadawit, so um, the very early 15th century ruler, was trying to illuminate a precious manuscript. And he was trying and failing um, to apply gold leaf. And then he had a dream and he saw a Byzantine man who showed him how to uh, apply the gold leaf. Um, and then he woke up and all of a sudden he managed to um, apply the gold leaf. And it was so beautiful that it didn't please uh, just the ruler. It didn't please only Atzadawid, but it even pleased the virgin herself. Um, and this is a very early uh, 15th century miracle of Mary. Um, so I think that is in itself evocative. Um, it seems to be a recurring feature uh, that there is an interest in metal work and especially also in gilding. Um, I didn't have time to go into it today, but um, many of these royal churches that were being built in the 15th and early 16th century appear to have been either panelled with precious metals or even gilded on the inside again, mirroring um, the descriptions of Solomon's temple. So um, it's in a way not a surprise that this is a recurrent interest. Thank you, Frina. I'm going to um, move to a question that I think will widen out the discussion in some interesting ways as well from Monica Green, um, who thanks all the panelists and says, as someone who has herself moved into the global medieval uh, in the past decade, I've been supported in my conviction that medieval really captures a common physical world. None of the speakers mentioned either climate history nor the first and second plague pandemics in both of which Ethiopia was involved and she notes Dira on the latter. Can the speakers discuss why they haven't brought in these factors in their presentations today? I feel as though that's something Samantha might have commented on if she had been here with us, but perhaps the others might have something to say. Well, I mean, uh, if I might just answer um, in my specific case, because I'm very much a cultural historian, and this is something that I mean, I've read Marie Lauderat's um, research on this, and I've followed Monica Green's research, because I keep teaching about the Black Death in the 14th century as part of my um, job here in Bochum. Um, and I think, I mean, at this point, I, I've been wondering really how these epidemics that we now know impacted Ethiopian society, especially in the 15th century, how that must have necessarily also impacted these building activities and everything else, sending out the missions. I mean, sending a mission um, or an embassy from the Ethiopian highlands all the way to the Western Mediterranean was quite a schlep to begin with. 
but doing it in a climate where also, for example, Mamluk Egypt had recurring waves of the plague um, is just mind boggling to think about. Uh, but at this point, I really just don't know enough yet. And hopefully the further down we go with my career, I might be able to go away from my art history, cultural focus towards such questions, because I think they're eminently um, uh, fascinating. And also I think a very good uh, way to integrate Ethiopia into a larger Afro-Eurasian medieval world. I think the, um, just to comment on the plague, uh, I know from the account of Christos Samra in the act of Christos Samra, which is, um, she was a 15th century saint, Ethiopian woman saint, so she's an indigenous saint. There is a mention of, uh, of plague that will engulf uh, the world. And I don't know if, if it was Getacho Haile or another scholar who kind of relates that plague to the Black Death. Um, it's a text that, again, that's there, it's available for anybody to, uh, to consult. Do you want to comment on that as well, Alessandro, before we go to the next? Let's go to the next, I think. Okay. Aaron? Yeah. yeah. Um, it might be somewhat of a follow-up question, but I thought it was an interesting question from Steve Kaplan. And it says, for many years, Ethiopian archaeology was largely focused on prehistory and Aksumite studies. And in recent years, important work on later periods has been done. So would any of the um, panelists like to comment on this archeological perspective and tensions between textual work and archeological work? There's of course a new tension in, in the medieval period. Yeah. Well, maybe I, I, I can say something on this. Uh, and I think, uh, yes, uh, this is absolutely true. We have a real now medieval archeology, span let's call it so and uh, a study of architecture. And I think uh, most interestingly, this is also being connected with uh, the um, development of liturgy. So uh, Michael Jervers and uh, Emmanuel Fritsch have really made valuable contributions and uh, they have been able to, uh, to uh, interconnect these two aspects. And I think there is really a, a huge uh, potential uh, still uh, to be exploited concerning these aspects. Uh, the point is that uh, careful descriptions, uh, uh, archaeological excavations, and, and, and everything which is needed uh, is difficult to carry out, uh, all the more, of course, in the present day. So, um, and it, it's a work that it is uh, almost at the beginning, but uh, I think it, it, it's a quite uh, well focused observation. Please. Can I say something? I mean, um, in the last webinar, we had Felix Salam Yoga uh, speak about the discrepancies as well between textual evidence and timelines and whatnot. And I think actually this, even if there is a tension between archaeological work and textual sources, this can be quite fruitful for, because, I mean, the tensions in itself reveal, I think, quite a bit about um, at least the textual culture that these texts were then produced in uh, and might open up new avenues for investigation. And uh, just personally, um, so having now worked so much on these royal monasteries and churches of the 15th and early 16th century, as some of you might know, none of them remain standing as they were in this time, right at this minute. Um, but they have been very preliminary, ex uh, no, not even excavation surveys, uh, mostly in the 60s and 70s. And I think, I mean, carrying out proper archaeological investigations of these later medieval sites would open up, like would blow the door wide open for an entirely new chapter, I think, of Ethiopian cultural history, but much more than that. Um, so I, I would personally see it as an enrich enrichment. Um, Go to the next question. Um, I think here again, a, a, a sort of broad ranging question. This one from Wendy Belcher might be interesting for, to share among the, the group. Um, Wendy writes, Johannes Fabian warned in time and the other about treating non-European cultures and peoples as representing Europe's past. He insisted on seeing all cultures as coeval at the same time and none as belated. And given the increased understanding of the links of global history, his comment seems even more relevant. She goes on to say, 
The term medieval or middle ages has tremendous baggage, but it might be worse to imply that Ethiopia is somehow outside of that period or worse belated. Um, she develops that a little bit more. We do see the egregious centering of Europe and the typical periodization of Africa into post-colonial, colonial and pre-colonial with the latter uh, representing 30 centuries of human history and the last two 100 years each. So she said, but given coevalness, she'd argue for the use of Middle Ages for the 400s through the 1300s in the Horn of Africa. And here, I, I, I wondered if um, we might return a little bit to some of the comments that Alessandro was making in his uh, lecture. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about this, both from Professor Bausi and from the others. You are unfolding a little bit the ways in which we might compare the shorter periods that we capture under the rubric of medieval. So for example, you mentioned in Europe, humanism or Renaissance and things like this as sort of um, being sort of subdivisions or other places to mark the turning point. Um, and also you brought out, and then Samantha Kelly and her talk also brought out the distinctions when we take, when we distinguish between axomite and um, late axomite or post axomite, Zadwe and Solomonic. Can we, can we talk a little bit more about the role of these sort of not micro periods, but smaller periods in nuancing the ways in which we engage with, with this whole question of the medieval? I don't know if you might like to begin, Alessandro, and perhaps um, Frina and Eva may have some thoughts as well. Well, I can start. Um, I think it's, a, of course, it's a very difficult point, uh, this one. And um, I was thinking also of uh, these terms like humanism, renaissance, uh, and reformation and so on, because they have, these also have been periods which in the, let's say, traditional medieval history have been uh, exactly um, uh, always uh, as op opposed uh, to the Middle Ages, uh, according to uh, different times. So uh, the, the origin of Middle Ages uh, in the end, I think, is rooted uh, in, uh, in defining these periods or also how people started to, uh, to look at the past. So I was thinking that, that there might be also periods in Ethiopian history where these categories could apply. So for example, reformation, whom uh, should we call the, uh, uh, if we would like to establish such a So uh, Zara Jacob or maybe the uh, uh, Stephanozites because they, they could also have some claim in, in that. And, and similar cases. So, for example, was uh, Georgis uh, uh, of Segla a humanist? Because this was he was one of the last ones who was able to attain all sources, uh, as far as we can see, which then disappear. So, uh, uh, we we, do, we we know too little, also, or we haven't yet paid attention to the way in which the past has been interpreted and uh, perceived. And also, uh, we think. So we assume that the authors uh, had at their disposal what has remained to us. So we have really to get out of this paradigm and think uh, that uh, uh, there, there, was, uh, there was a completely different of uh, um, scholarly arrangement in terms of texts uh, and uh, sources uh, uh, in centuries uh, uh, from which only a part has arrived to us, only a small portion has arrived to us. So this is not exactly the point, uh, Susanna, you, you raised it, I understand, I understand it. But I think uh, that even, uh, um, let's say, in the important book by Marie Lordera, the question of the continuity or not of the Zagwe period uh, with the Aksumite past, uh, and also uh, the continuity with the Solomonic period is really a, a crucial point. And I think we have really to work uh, along this direction. So I don't have any recipes now to say, you know, <laughs> obviously, but I think uh, this is the right way and we have to look uh, at uh, uh, internal sources, first of all, I would say. And then of course, we have to use everything which is at, at our disposal. But first of all, we should write, try to understand uh, so what was in the head of the people uh, in, in those times. Hey, Uba, I'm reminded of the commentary manuscript you were showing us and thinking about what that tells us about intellectual community. Again, thinking of... So this is, again, um, the Bowsey's point that we need to look at the, um, the sources. And I think that... And, and don't forget, you know, it was a period of great change. <laughs> you know, things were happening really fast. Um, you're looking at, I mean, the trans, the transition from the Zagao to the Solomonic dynasty. Uh, it appears to be fast for me, but maybe that's because of, despite of 
um, lack of research is done around it. Um, the commentary tradition uh, uh, is something for me that's always been really, um, you know, not really looked at properly. With uh, the only work I can cite is that of um, Roger Crowley, um, who worked on a commentary, uh, and he was the only capable, really great scholar, in my opinion, to really look at the, the commentary tradition. Um, there is a great tradition in commentary tradition in Ethiopia. Um, the, the text out there, are, are, they're still unexplored, they're still unpublished. And you have this cross-disciplinary uh, of these scholars working on not just commentary, but they're also working on other theological text. And most would have, have to graduated from a high establishment, to, uh, educational establishment. You, let's just call it university. I mean, the equivalent of a medieval universities. And in those commentary, you also get technique, um, how to approach texts, uh, how to approach the text, how to approach the translation. And many stories about the Greek and uh, people like St. Um, Ephraim's work when he was um, still a student. So those great traditions, they didn't just come out of some translation work. It, 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 and there's great orality as well in the commentary tradition that still, um, exists. Farina, do you want to comment on this a little bit as well? I was thinking especially about the how Sabetha addressed in her talk the, the Solomonic period and where her handbook cut off with regard to that um, and thinking about your work extending into what in other kinds of historical settings we might discuss as the early modern. I don't know if that's something you want to comment on. Yeah, I mean, so this is one thing that also came up, I think, uh, incidentally in my talk today, is that the Horn of Africa in the early 16th century is a very different world from the Horn of Africa in the 15th century. And um, so there was this whole brouhaha in um, German newspapers two years ago about whether or not one could actually use the term Middle Ages for places that were not in Europe, you had very esteemed grandma professors of German <laughs> um, medieval history commenting uh, and pointing out that, for example, the discovery of the, Amer discovery of the Americas um, didn't have like immediate impact on contemporaries in, uh, in Europe. But what I always think about is that uh, much more important than Columbus would be, um, I think the circumnavigation of the African continent by the Portuguese um, and the Portuguese presence in the Indian Ocean and then the Red Sea and how that upsets uh, trade networks, dynam uh, powers uh, and everything else. Uh, and then the Ottomans in the Red Sea and Indian Ocean, which happens more or less concurrently. Um, and so that uh, we do find indeed, I think, a sort of cutoff date that matches um, European notions of the end of the Middle Ages. Um, but even within Ethiopia, then you have this, this series of wars that start in the late 1520s and go until the early 1540s, which just demarcate quite clearly, I think, a, a, an Ethiopia before and after. And I think it is close enough to other regions that um, like, I, I, I've never been somebody who actually bristled against including Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa into these larger sort of redefined concepts of the Middle Ages. Um, because of course, Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa was not unconnected and it is a fi fiction. And I think we've come a long way since the whole, what was it, uh, Deserts, Distance and Islam by Crawford and in the 1950s, um, uh, these notions about Ethiopia. Um, so, yeah. Aaron? Thank you. Um, I had my own question that was, um, it pushes on the other side of the time scale. And that is, I, I would direct it to Samantha if she was here, but I can direct it to the panelists. But um, as I understood Samantha, there's quite a fuzziness on that other side of the time scale of when do we start at the Zagwe or do we have to push into the Aksumite period to kind of get a sense of the Solomonic um, material. And I wanted to put this in conversation with a question that Steve Kaplan asked, and this is his question, then I'll kind of formulate it for you. 
um, Kaplan says, in recent years, there's been a growing perspective that many episodes in early Ethiopian history, I think he means late antique Aksumite, such as the Zana's conversion, the early saints, probably thinking of the nine saints here, the Zagwe, are largely shaped by medieval inventions of these periods. And the question is, have we gone too far in uprooting early Ethiopian history? So I, I want to put these together in this way that um, if <laughs> My answer to Steve is that we haven't gone far enough, but, but that's beside the point. But that if a lot of these early moments in Ethiopian history are um, at least viewed through the medieval period, or uh, maybe even invented in the medieval period, and if we're kind of slowly kind of pushing the medieval period um, earlier and earlier, as Samantha was um, advocating for, I think, um, what's left of Ethiopian history in this early period outside of the medieval period. That is a, the break between, you know, late antique axum and medieval axum is um, kind of disappearing. So if, for instance, if you wanted to write a handbook on um, the pre-medieval <laughs> Ethiopian Eritrea, what would there be exactly? How would that work? Well, if I may, so. I think that, for example, if you read the essay by George Atkey on this, uh, he has tried to he has tried to do that. He stops more or less at the 10th century, and he gives some of the perspective on the further period. And this is his attempt. He compares. He works uh, very closely comparing Ethiopia with Nubia, and we have also we haven't spoke about that, uh, but I think uh, there has been a, an explosion also of the evidence uh, uh, from. Uh, um, late antique and early medieval Nubia, which is also interesting uh, for uh, even for, for Ethiopia. Uh, so there was uh, some years ago, a few years ago, the publication of a short note, which for the first time mentioned in uh, in Greek, in Nubia, uh, an archbishop of Aksum. So this is something which really is uh, is astonishing, and changes a lot our our uh, perspective also of the relationships. Uh, of that period, which remains extremely uh, obscure, of course, as we know. So uh, the point of the uh, traditions on uh, the early, the, the Aksumite period, uh, uh, well, we know uh, there was a wonderful case studied by Susanne Hummel uh, that really uh, the reworking of traditions uh, uh, never ends. And even at the beginning of the 20th century, there were rewritten traditions on uh, Axumite foundations uh, of uh, churches. So, and, and we have really uh, an, an evidence uh, which is uh, without any doubt that this was a continuous concern, again, uh, to look at the past. We, we should quote also, and uh, uh, for lack of time, I didn't do it, but uh, an article by Bertrand Hirsch and uh, uh, for Ma, Axum après, après Axum where he was, uh, I think it was methodologically very inspiring, uh, very inspiring because he, he was exactly dealing uh, with the recovery of traditions in the 15th century at the time and also later, of course, in the 20th. So we, we are uh, at the moment where we try to disentangle everything to see what was later created by, tradition, by the tradition and what uh, uh, came later. We know that uh, what, for example, Biondo Flavio, uh, collected from the Ethiopian delegation uh, in Rome in 1441 um, uh, concerning the expedition of the Ethiopians to, to South Arabia depended from a hagiography which was translated at the earliest in the 13th century. This, this was a hagiographic text which dealt with the Aksumite past translated probably in the 13th century and which has shaped then uh, the, the Ethiopian memory of that past uh, for the centuries to come. So a, a very an extremely complex uh, a process of transmission uh, and acquisition of knowledge about uh, the past. So uh, it's not easy at all. And uh, we have to do everything in order to, uh, to make uh, things clear as much as possible. Aaron has also his plans concerning uh, the traditions on Promensius uh, and uh, the question of the uh, Jewish and Aramaic uh, loan words and so on. I think uh, there are many ways in which we can try to, uh, to understand better. Thank you. I think here yeah, as yeah. well, I uh, also would like to mention uh, 
sort of the institutional memories, um, and, and this has been documented really well right up to the early 19th century, especially by chronicle writers of Minilik who always begin the history of Ethiopia from the time of the serpent, which ruled Ethiopia pre axum um, And that gets, uh, that institutional memory is, is, um, is a resource that still continued and historians like um, Amharic writers like uh, Taklas Adik Mokre, who actually has covered uh, a lot of the Ethiopian period from Aksum to um, uh, Minilik, they've also greatly contributed um, to, to the field of Ethiopian studies. I know there is no PhD in Amharic in Ethiopia, which is a bit strange. <laughs> you know, we're talking about um, you know, the language or the culture, but the, 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 but there are important Amharic works out there on Ethiopian history, um, particularly written by the clergy as well, um, which really should be um, considered. Thank you for that, Eob, especially um, in bringing out the, the function of, of oral history and oral narrative, that is, if we're especially we're talking about cultures that are committed to certain kinds of memorization techniques and certain ways of maintaining memory in collective ways, in community-based ways, in schools and so on, maybe we have to measure it and use it in ways that are slightly different from the way in which we're using those manuscript sources, but that doesn't mean it's not also enormously useful. Um, so I, I, I'd love to think more about that. Um, one question that is here addressed to Farina Krebs, but I wonder if um, it, it might be of interest to others in the panel as well, from Samuel Tsagai who says, I am interested in the history of maps and mapping in pre-modern Ethiopia, and I'm wondering if you have come across in your research any cartographic exchange between Ethiopia and Europe. Um, so Farina, if you wanna address it, I don't know if um, the others might have some thoughts as well. Um, yeah, so it, it is fairly well known that from our, in the uh, mid 15th century, around 1450, actually explicitly interviewed and consulted Ethiopian pilgrims that were found in the Ital uh, Italian peninsula um, about their realm and the, um, the map that he then produced, which is also beautifully edited, um, has like a depth of detail that is really just quite stunning. Um, we also have a map uh, also produced in the uh, 1450s, um, the Egyptus Novello, um, that appears to draw from the knowledge of Ethiopian pilgrims. Um, now, when we do try to do the reverse, um, were there maps uh, produced in Ethiopia about the larger world? Um, to my knowledge, not really. I know that Sophia Degemüller gave a talk in 2018 about Ethiopian maps. Um, and uh, but if I remember correctly, um, at least not for this early uh, early phase, or not in the way that, that I think the maps were more con um, concerned with a representation of um, the world as a theological concept, and not in uh, the, the the map sense that uh, we find with Frau Mauro, for example. So not a, a representation of specific places in Latin Europe, for example, that would have been carried back maybe from the Ethiopian ambassadors that came back to the Highland realm. Good. Um, are there, uh, Ayub, would you like to add a little bit? Yeah, I, I think we had this discussion before. So I've been literally hunting for maps in manuscripts and I did come across later ones with mention of areas, but not in the sort of diagram drawing, um, but there was a talisman that sort of resembled uh, a map, but I have to somehow uh, dig it somewhere. But I don't, I only know the Amharic word for map, which is Italian, carta. So I I don't know the Ethiopic word for, for, for what is map. It would be interesting to, to, to um, find this out. Alessandro, did you want to add to that at all? No, I don't, I don't have much to, Mention. I can only say that maybe for another period, but there is a project uh, by Eloi Fiquet and uh, Volber Smith, uh, which is taking care of collecting uh, uh, maps uh, from, from the past. But of course, uh, most of the evidence, as far as I know, focuses on a, a later period. Aaron? Yeah. 
Um, since we're nearing the end of our time for this um, webinar, and this is the kind of second of these webinars, I just wanted to ask maybe if the participants wanted to each take a maybe a minute or something to just kind of reflect on what um, are the advantages and disadvantages for Ethiopian studies, studying it within a kind of a broader medieval framework and for medieval studies for continuing Ethiopia. I mean, I know it's a huge question, that's what the lectures, but I mean, if you had to distill things down for, you know, <laughs> a mi minute each, I mean, what, what would you say about this kind of question of this intersection between fields? Yeah, sorry for putting you on the spot. <laughs> Well, it's long overdue. Uh, and I think, like I said, the resources are there. Um, again, uh, both in Amharic, in Giz, and of course, um, at the British Library, I didn't even mention the first letter that was sent um, by Henry IV um, to Abyssinia. And of course, we get later accounts of, uh, of Armenian traders. So, the, and of course the archeological, the paintings, there's so much resource out there. And to be honest, it's still a virgin field for anybody who wants to, you know, contribute um, from a different um, perspective. I think, I mean, maybe I was just sort of, um, uh, I grew into this naturally because um, in my time as a student, I was taught by somebody who taught medieval studies as centered on the Holy Land and from Jerusalem. So my medieval world that I sort of, I don't know, absorbed as a student um, was never quite centered on Europe. Um, and it always included like places, people's religions um, from Beijing to uh, the Atlantic and uh, from the Ethiopian highlands uh, to the very north. And um, I think, I mean, maybe I've just come to this um, blindly, uh, but I, th I think, I mean, there needn't be, um, I think, uh, a dividing line. And as I like telling my students, there isn't an invisible wall east of Hungary and there isn't an invisible wall through the Mediterranean. Um, and coming to this from, uh, uh, coming to this as a medievalist, I think, um, I mean, studying the world in a more interconnected way opens up, of course, broader questions, but also makes us re-question things we thought held true for individual specific niche fields. And I think, um, so it is long overdue. And as I just said, it is still quite a, uh, a virgin field. And, uh, but, but it seems to be moving in a, in a great direction. So that is very heartening by itself. If I may also, of course, I also agree, uh, and I would say it's, un it's unavoidable. So we cannot simply work without having this broader perspective, but we must be also we be ready in accepting what this means. So I, I, I have in mind, for example, for example, uh, the, uh, what I call the negotiations, uh, uh, post-colonial negotiations with uh, institutional views uh, uh, inside, uh, Ethiopia and particularly from some institutions, which would like to look at themselves as something which is self-sufficient to some extent. Well, uh, this is a point uh, which is very delicate and the same applies for, let's say, uh, for the uh, chronological depth of traditions which are maintained today. So a free investigation is free investigation. And uh, uh, we, we have to, uh, we have, I think, to define which are the, uh, the shared evidence on which we want to build our own knowledge. So that's why the, the point of a syllabus. So for example, what is expected from a philologist or what is expected from a historian in terms of uh, access direct to sources or not? Uh, uh, th this, is a, this is a crucial point. So uh, when we have a miracle of Mary, sh shall we look at it only as a translation from Arabic, uh, from uh, a Romance language and, and so on. Not, of course, uh, we have to look at it also as an original creation, but it's still also a miracle with uh, some aspects which have this long journey behind. So uh, we have to encompass everything. And I, in my view, uh, these few lines from Ceruli were already said everything when he said uh, we have to look beyond uh, the African horizon 
in one point, and also not to look only at uh, um, at, create, at at works as uh, a work of translation. So we have to go beyond that. But still, it's difficult in in, in practice. I think. Thank you so much. I think that that's a fabulous place to end. Um, we wanted to thank all of the our panelists for being here. I think the conversation has been just extremely enlightening. I think you would agree. And also thank all of the attendees. I want to remind you that on May 14th, um, there will be our last session. It's going to be on Beyond Ethiopia, the Islamic Intellectual History of the Horn of Africa. And that these um, panels today, they will be made available online at the website that you can find at the top of the chat. So thanks to everyone. And um, a huge thanks from my co-organizers, Sabina Schmitka, Suzanne Akbari, and Samantha Kelly. Thank you. <laughs>